So my presentation is going to be on feedback loops in opinion modeling. And I will, my, so I'm Danielle Ensign, my mentor is Jeff Wood. So I'm gonna briefly overview here, where I'm gonna talk about why this is a problem we should study. I'm going to then give a literature review of just like briefly lenses on opinion modeling. And then I'm gonna talk about the particular thing we studied, which is when models produce data, that then goes back into models and an application of temperature decay. So why study opinion modeling? Well, in AI safety, it would be useful to understand how preferences change over time and sort of open-endedness and data augmentation. It would be good to understand what are the processes that are leading to this data we're sending into our models. And in AI fairness, there is this concern that as language models generate text in the world, they may affect sort of this opinion ecosystem that exists out there. And so it would be good to understand how that happens and how it affects models themselves. So first, a, a brief literature review. We have language modeling, which is essentially where you take lots of data and then you feed that uh, data into a language model and it sort of captures a snapshot in time. Um, so this is useful, but it doesn't quite capture a lot of these dynamic questions. They might ask like how the process is changing over time. And so we do have some previous work that people have done on there's like a Facebook scale simulator or people that study GitHub and these find that there's sort of these spikes, but it, it's hard to get sort of this detailed analysis when you're just doing these learning systems. And so another thing you can do is these agent-based or physics kind of models. And one thing they find there is that reality is very sort of nuanced. It's hard to concretely define these particular things because they're very interacting with each other. And so one thing people do is they try to take like a systems theory approach where they study the structure for many interacting parts. But the problem here is it's very hard to have like choose the right sort of level of fine grainedness of your models. And so one thing you can do is use these empirical laws we see in real world data and then use that to sort of validate your models. And then finally, there's sort of this other perspective of looking at these networks and you look at sort of how the data is moving across through like how opinions, the, the density of the networks and different things like that. And that can give you some insight into what's happening. So there's a lot of other things. In particular, we decided to study a particular problem, which is where you have models that are outputting data and that's fed back into the models themselves. So concretely, right now, there are models like GPT-3 that are outputting text that's going on the internet and those data is going to go back into future models. And so it would be good to understand what things we should be worried about here and what's happening. So here's the setup that we're gonna do. We're gonna take some data, we're gonna feed it into a trained model, we're gonna generate some data, we're gonna use that to train another model, we're gonna generate some more data and repeat. And you can imagine a couple of variations of this. Maybe we're gonna fine tune the model instead of training one from scratch, or maybe we're in a classification setting where we label this data distribution and that goes and that leads to a trained model. So um, very concretely here, let's consider this coin setting where we have, so we have, we're going to flip lots of coins. And then in this case, we ended up with the same amount of heads and tails. And so our new probability is 0 0.5. We do this again, and we ended up with 13 heads and seven tails. So our new probability of heads is 0 0.65. And we can repeat this multiple times. And there's a couple of things you find when you start doing this formal analysis on like linear classifiers or coins. And two insights are, first of all, that more data tends to lead to a decreased step size. And this just makes sense. Uh, it gives you a better estimator. And the second insight is when you look at this, we ended up at all tails. And the reason for this is because there is some probability of just outputting the same token over and over. And once that happens, then it's gonna be stuck there. And so for example, uh, you could imagine all heads or all tails or, or even more generally, imagine if we have more than two outcomes in a discrete setting. So we can do some random walk on these and eventually one of these is gonna end up at zero in which case we're back to the two token setting. So there's some theory. Uh, one other thing that's worth talking about in the theory setting is this temperature. So with temperature, I have this graph here and this is showing, so when this red line is, is just a line with the green line, that's temperature 1.0. And when the red line is horizontal, that's temperature 0.0. And so what you see here is that when we sample with temperature, what's gonna happen is things that are 0.5 or higher are gonna be pushed up. And things that are below 0.5 are gonna be pushed down. This has real world implications because what this means is that when we sample from models, we're gonna be perpetuating existing biases. This is bias in the technical sense. 
uh, it, it's less clear if you can argue that this applies to bias like in the real world, but uh, it, it certainly at least seems like it would speed up this collapse issue that we're talking about. So there's some theory, but how does this apply in practice? Well, first what we did is we looked at some n-gram models where you can actually run the theory. And what the theory suggests is that it should collapse to a single path on the graph from the start to the end. And that path should have no cycles because if there is a cycle that represents two different places we went and one of those directions is going to be collapsed. And in fact, that's what we found. Uh, just doing a basic n-gram, this sort of traditional um, NLP modeling, we found after doing 10,000 iters of the step, it collapsed to by being missed, I will not wish the apart cousin of duty. So that's great, but transformers are really sort of more modern language models. And so, uh, the question is what happens with transformers there there is this tricky question of like how do you measure collapse and one way you can do this is by modeling temperature or by modeling entropy so if we generate lots of sentences and then we compute the probability of each sentence just by multiplying the probabilities of each word and then average over lots of those sentences we get a rough estimate of the entropy of the model itself so as a reminder here's what we're doing we're taking data into a trained model and I'd like you to sort of guess what you think is going to happen with a transformer when we just feed it back into here. So, okay. Um, what we find is that there are two settings. The, the first is basically, it just sort of shoots off to entropy randomness where it, yeah, it, it sort of just becomes this uniform outputting thing roughly. It, it's still sort of centers on things, but it becomes this very sort of random generation. The other thing we find is this behavior here, where it sort of shoots up initially, and then it goes down to this collapse, as the theory predicted. Concretely here, so it starts out, we have this plankton or aggressive wildlife some days in the season, just kind of standard output. And then it, if you've looked at the outputs of language models, you know that a lot of the outputs are pretty weird. And so what's happening is the language models are sort of getting used to the outputs being, at least what, what seems to be happening, is the language models are getting used to these outputs being weirder than they are used to as their inputs. And so we end up with the generation quality seems to decrease, and then eventually it hits this cap where now it's sort of used to how weird the output is. And then we have these cycles that happen. So for example, um, hi, hello, hi, hello, it might just repeat something like that. And once that cycle appears in a generated output, the model will see that, and that will be more likely to be produced in the future. And so we'll repeat this. Um, and then it'll be sort of perpetuated in there. And so if you look at these, like these are the most common tokens at the peak, they're pretty common tokens, but what happens is it sort of focuses on particularly weird little loops. So in this case, it really liked to say Twitter a lot or ally a lot, but you, we, we ran some other runs. So this one eventually just focused on saying enemy over and over. And the important point here is that we have this collapse behavior. So that's the theory. Um, what the theory also suggests is that entropy, we would, or, or that temperature, if we have a temperature below 0 0.1 or below 1.0, then we would expect it to um, collapse quicker. And if we have temperature above 1.0, then we would expect it to go to this entropy. And that is what we find. So if we have temperature below 1.0, we find that it very quickly collapses. You'll recall over here, it took 250 steps. Here, it only took about 20. And with very, very low temperature, it collapses almost immediately to the sentences, like essentially just the most common sentence. Whereas with higher temperatures, it has some time to fiddle around before it collapses. And then, yeah, with temperatures above 1.0, it just sort of takes off to essentially the maximum entropy it can get to. Um, so future work in this direction, uh, it would be good to have better understanding of what's happening in this process. It would be good to sort of, un to, to run more runs and understand some of the variability. Some of these take a very long time. So it would be good to understand if there's other kinds of outcomes. These are the, I'm describing the general patterns we've seen. Uh, it would be good to understand like, if we are perpetuating real world biases, you know, uh, there's an argument that temperature sort of leads to these models being mode seeking, where they will output the most common thing. And then that goes back into later models. And so you can imagine that it should be perpetuating bias, but it's hard to necessarily argue that. And then 
finally, there's the, this temperature decay phenomenon where because this lower temperature things are being fed back into the models and the model gets used to it and that we get less entropy, that seems like a problem. And so, uh, you know, the one other thing here is all of this theory seems a little iffy, like in practice, when we like are feeding this models into the real world, there's some filter on what data actually goes out there. And so to, and so we should under like, and so really we should incorporate in this model some kind of feedback thing that is filtering what data is going out there. And so uh, this is analogous to if you have like a Go playing um, system, then you only are feeding back the things that do well. And so that, that's a relevant piece here as well. So yeah, that's my presentation. Um, and thank you to everyone, um, my mentors and everyone that was able to help. And uh, yeah, I'm open to questions now. Cool. So uh, the first question we have is for the language model at t equals one, does entropy always increase and then decrease? Yeah, so sometimes it does seem to just take off to really high entropy. Sometimes it does uh, do that up and then back down. We haven't ever seen it just go down. And honestly, it's kind of weird that it pretty like consistently goes down. It doesn't do much of a random walk. Whereas for like the theory, it suggests it should be doing a bit of a random walk. And so there's a lot of open questions there. Uh, so there's a question here. Would you see the same effect if you extend the data set instead of replacing it with model samples? So this is another direction that you can, yeah, that I, I think is really interesting. It's essentially this question of grounding. So I have a couple slides here on this one where you can imagine instead of just directly using the data into a trained model, we actually have some uh, ground truth data that we're also feeding into the model. This, in principle, this can uh, help quite a bit because like we're just doing a random walk at each step. If you bias the random walk towards a particular distribution, then we would expect that random walk to not, or, or to, to roughly stay around there. And for small n-gram models, we did find that this helped. Uh, and this is relevant in practice because these models are going to be feeding back into themselves and so or, or and these models are going to be taking sort of also real world data um but yeah we, we haven't validated this on language models and I, I think it's a really interesting question yeah so the implications of this work for semi-supervised learning uh so i i think that yeah it's um that's a tricky question. I, I think I would need to think more about that. Um, yeah, so you could certainly imagine like at the limit of labeling data just from some small set of data that you may end up with some feedback loops, but it's less clear. I, I think that's a nuanced and tricky question. Yeah, I'm not sure I have a great answer for you on that one. Uh, the final question we have here is, we're able to look at what happens if the outputs are only some smallish percentage of the input for the next training step mixed with new real world data. Um, yeah, so that, that's this grounding setting and we have not ran it on language models. I did ran it for the n-gram things. And honestly, my intuition is that yeah, just a very small percent would help significantly. You know, it's worth pointing out that these things are like, in practice, we're only going to be doing a couple of steps. We're not going to be doing 10,000 steps, which is how many we needed to converge. And so like, um, in practice, if you have some of this grounding data that may make a big difference. Yeah, um, so, uh, there was also a question, have you considered other settings apart from the coin setting? Um, yeah, so we, we did that setting with lots of different models. Uh, we looked at like a linear classifier. So it's a little different there because instead of 
you know, this collapse, it just sort of randomly walks. If you don't have any bias, then it just sort of keeps cycling. And yeah, the, the, the general insight of sort of having either a random walk or uh, collapse for discrete things seems to be true in a lot of settings. But I, I think that it's worth doing a little more detailed analysis there because for some more complex models, it, you might be able to say something more interesting. Um, okay, so that's all the time I have. So I'm going to pass it off to Jonathan. Thank you, everyone.